Topic 1.6, developments in Europe. This is the last of the Unit 1 regions that we've been going through in the global tapestry. So let's get to it. On the question for today, central question, identify and explain the events, beliefs, and practices in Europe and what effect they had and during the period of 1200 and 1450. This is a straight up cause and effect, okay? So what are some events that had some causes, or what are the causes of those events, and then what effect did they have um, on Europe themselves? So basic context here is, um, you know, after the collapse of the western half of the Roman Empire, uh, there is going to be essentially a period that's come, sometimes known as the Dark Ages, which, you know, is a term that gets thrown out there, but it's, you know, essentially a different period uh, in European history where the once centralized power of the Roman Empire is replaced with decentralized powers uh, of dramatic tribes that are competing for um, land and resources within Europe, uh, such as the Frankish kingdom, which becomes um, essentially um, France over time, right? So over the next 600 years, Europe is basically um, fragmented into many different little states. Um, the Roman Catholic Church, though, is the one thing that really unifies uh, Europe and this idea, um, never because of patrician, but this idea of Christendom, uh, where you have all of the Christian nations uh, being under kind of one guidance and direction of the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope at the head of that. Um, and despite the power of the church, uh, Europe is still is largely politically decentralized. So even though the, the religion has a major influence, um, people still in Europe, um, the kings and the rulers still are not uh, will, willing to yield their power over the state and over the land itself. Um, but they do um, very much tap into the influence of the, the church itself. So um, here's the curriculum, uh, writing Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and the core beliefs practices of these religions continue to shape the societies of Europe. Um, Europe was politically fragmented and characterized by decentralized monarchies, feudalism, and manual systems. So we're going to talk about each one of these that are mentioned in the curriculum. So feudalism itself is a system that is but political, it's a social, it's an economic system of organization that occurs in Europe. It's also used in Japan um, a little differently, but it is used uh, primarily in Europe. And it was created out of a need to protect the, the local populations uh, from invading tribes or invading people. And, and there's multiple of them. One example that you're probably going to be familiar with are the Vikings from the Norselands, um, which is modern day Scandinavia. Um, it's a largely decentralized system of rule. Um, and essentially how it works is that you have a system of mutual obligation. You are obligated to somebody in this system. And so if you are a monarch, um, you essentially have the land grant rights over the entirety of the kingdom. And as a monarch, you cannot rule over that land without help. And so how do you do it? You hand out parcels of land to uh, people who will show a lot of loyalty to you, and that is your lords and vassals. Um, and so, you know, the people who are loyal to the king or queen are awarded land, and in doing so, by um, you know their loyalty, they show continue to show to the king or queen uh, is to provide them with support in terms of sometimes military um, you know armies and and soldiers to help you know lead to protect the, the kingdom or to expand the kingdom. Right? Um, those lords and vassals uh, are then in charge of the lands that they have been given uh, the permission to have by the king or queen. And then doing so, they kind of manage that land uh, you know, and the people who, who live on that. Um, and so when they manage that land, the people who live on that, um, they are typically your peasants and serfs. And they are the serfs themselves are people that are tied to the land specifically. Now, as a lord, your responsibility to the land and to your, those people is to protect them with your soldiers or whatever, um, building castles to help protect them from invaders or anything along those lines. But that was your responsibility. And then the serfs and peasants, in order to get that protection, they need to give something up to the Lord. And so what they do is they give them yields of their crop or they build, um, you know, 
stuff for them, you know, uh, artisans' works and things like that, um, swords, furniture, whatever, you know, and and that's how they continue to be allowed to live on that land and gain the protection of the of the Lord. Um, now the lords, you know, they would get knights and soldiers. Knights are the your professional armor clad soldiers, um, and so they, you know, act as both protectorate and also terrorizers of the peasants and the serfs. A lot of people, when they think about the Middle Ages of Europe, they look at knights as this romantic sense that they were, um, you know, good, honest people that protected and you know, had like a code to live by and such. And maybe that's the case in some places, but then you also have where the knights are acting almost like the mafioso. And so if the serfs aren't doing their job, who do you send in to, to make them do it? The knights. Um, so that's something that uh, kind of gets misconstrued in the romanticizing of this period, this time period. So there's a lot of political trends that are starting to happen in the late Middle Ages. And so we're starting to see, I mean, we're creeping towards a time where Europe is going to break out of the Dark Ages, quote unquote, and into a more um, classical um, sense of like Europe was during the, the Romans and the, and the Greeks. Um, but, um, there are some developments that occur and you started to see the employment of much larger bureaucracies and militaries, uh, and people, uh, kings uh, and monarchs who lead them. Um, this is, you know, trending towards what's going to happen in Europe in the next period of history. So some examples uh, to kind of show there's a growing sense of um, centralized government in Europe. Philip IV of France, uh, who ruled uh, from 1285 to 1314, he is going to create something called the Estes General. Um, this is something that probably doesn't means nothing to you right now, but it's something that becomes very important when we go in the future uh, and have the French Revolution because they revolt against this system. But essentially, it basically divides the society into three parts. The first part being people who are part of the royal blood and the royal family. The second uh, state um, is the, the priests and the, the heads of the church and so forth. And then the, the third estate is everyone else, all the peasants, all the serfs, everything like that. And while that helps him govern during that time, um, a little more um, control over the, the people and the land than he had previously, it certainly has consequences when it comes to that much later. Otto the First, um, who ends up declaring himself the emperor of the Holy Roman Emperor empire, um, which makes up mostly of what uh, today is Germany and the Austro, uh, Austria, and then, you know, this just big area right here, but it's mostly made up of kind of what we think of Germany nowadays. But um, he is going to declare himself the, the emperor of all those lands, and so he kind of unites all these uh, German states, uh, conflicting German states itself, um, and then uses the Roman Catholic Church to kind of help solidify that because the Roman Catholic Church recognizes him as the true leader and true emperor of the, of the Holy Roman Empire. And of course, William the Conqueror, which, uh, you know, if you ever take AP Euro, you'll love William the Conqueror because he was a Norman. So basically the Normans were the remnants of the Vikings that invaded France. And because the Vikings kept invading France and stealing all their stuff, um, they made a deal with them and say, hey, we'll give you this land in Normandy and then you can take it and you can settle it. You'll have much better farmland and so forth, live in peace, yada, yada, um, and then protect us at the same time. So they basically make them deals and then convert them to Christianity and here become the Normans. Well, then William the Conqueror, uh, who was the leader of the Normans, uh, ends up invading England and, uh, you know, attacking the Anglo-Saxon establishment of kingdoms that were already there. Um, and essentially wipes out all of the Anglo-Saxon kings um, in favor of himself to be the ruler of England and establishes uh, kind of the English people as we know today, combining the Anglo-Saxon and the Normans together to create uh, the early remnants of what we call, not remnants, early um, parts of, of English language, you know. So that's something that um, occurs during this time. It's really important to note. Um, and the, the monarchs of England continue to get more and more powerful uh, as time went on, um, but there is going to be some resistance to that. And in 1215, 
the nobles of King John um, decide to rebel against him. Not all of them, but most of them do. And uh, they rebel against him because they thought the king was abusing his power too much and they were being left out without any. And so they basically rebel against him. They force him to sign what's known as the Magna Carta, basically stating that the power of the king is no longer absolute, that the king can't just do what he wants and so forth. Um, and it gave some more power to the lords. Um, so that's an important document to note because it definitely has influence on the next generation of politics um, as they do more um, you know, enlightenment ideas and more power to the people ideas. Okay, so the next thing is the is just a simple overview of um, you know, social interaction and organization. Um, the process by which societies, groups, their members, and norms that govern their interactions between those groups and between individuals influence political, economic, and cultural institutions and organizations. More specifically to this unit, Europe was largely an agricultural society dependent on free and coerced labor, including serfdom. So let's talk about the manorial system itself. The manorial system is uh, where you'll find those serfs and, and you'll find more coarse labor and so forth. So um, these larger fiefs, these larger land grants were commonly known as manors. Um, the manors themselves were economically self-sufficient. So everything you needed could be made or grown on the manor. Um, so the need for trade isn't as heavy in uh, Europe at this time as it was um, in previous eras or previous other parts of the world. And so because they, they have um, you know, everything they need or they essentially everything they think they need, um, they still need one thing that they must have a consistent supply of was labor. And so they, you know, serfs came along and such. And so once you're a serf, you're essentially in this kind of quasi slavery. It's um, you're tied to the land. And so if you were born on the land, you're tied to that land. You can't leave. You have to do the job that is expected of you and so forth. If you want to continue to get protection from the Lord. Um, but essentially they, the serfs, the peasants who live on this, they owe fealty and they pay their taxes in the form of goods and, and services. And that's how it works uh, in middle aged Europe, right? Um, agricultural technology is improving a lot during this time too. Uh, that's important to note because the population of the, um, the world starts to increase and Europe is starting to increase as well. Uh, they are able to use systems like the three field system uh, to where they are going to um, better manage the land in which they grow things on so that they don't dry it out of nutrients, uh, you know, within a generation. So they would essentially kind of rotate these fields. One field would be growing wheat, which you would turn into flour, which makes bread, which feeds more mouths. Um, the second field is, you know, barley or other vegetables or whatnot. And then the third field is uh, fallow or animal grazing land. So the fallow is where like, here's let the time for the, the land to rest, um, to get nutrients back. And then where does that nutrients come from? Well, it comes in the form of animal done. And so the cows, cattle, whatever that they're growing on here, um, they eat, they do their business, and then it goes back into the soil and it creates nutrients and so fertilizes the land and so then they continue the rotation. So um, this is something that helps increase the production of food in Europe at this time as well as new types of plows as, and windmills um, help make it possible to grind more flour, um, wheat into flour and again feed more mouths. So you can see here's like an upward trend of the population of the world, um, you know, during this time, you know, part with what's going on in Europe. Um, and then this happens. And you probably, some of you already know what happens there. But let's talk about it. It's the Black Death. And the Black Death uh, was one of the deadliest pandemics. It says here the deadliest pandemic, but you could argue that the smallpox pandemic uh, in the Americas was equally or if not more deadly. Um, but it is hard to tell. How do you tell, measure this when you don't have a record of how many people are, you know, dying? Um, like, you know, we do today, even today, it's like, you know, we, we probably see have more people than our, what their numbers show um, with the current pandemic that we're experiencing right now. 
So between 25 and 200 million people died um, in the Black Death uh, in Europe, in parts of Asia as well. Um, and it was devastating to the populations. So anywhere between 30 and 50% of Europeans' population is just wiped out. That has economic implications, has political implications, social. I mean, it's just, it is a, takes a toll on the European people. Other, other events that do have important influence on Europe um, number one, the Crusades. And the Crusades were a series of military campaigns that uh, took armies from Christendom. There weren't any one kingdom at the time that uh, would partake in the Crusades. Um, I'm trying to think how many in total. It's like 14 total, but I only really – there's only really four major Crusades. And then my favorite one is the Children's Crusade, which um, – yeah, it's a very sad story, and uh, if you want to know about it, you feel free to uh, you know, email me, or um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about it in class if we have time. But the Crusades themselves, largely unsuccessful. The First Crusade is able to cap recapture the parts of the Holy Land, particularly Jerusalem, for only a period of about ninety years, um, and it was and it's a short period. But the um, city of Jerusalem is still a very sacred site to other religions, including Islam. And the Seljuk Turks uh, would not be happy with and satisfied with that land uh, being under the control of Christians um, because they did not allow pilgrimage uh, to occur. Um, and so over time, the relationship between the two sides breaks down to where um, they fight again and the Christian armies lose Jerusalem. And they really don't gain it back for an extended period of time after that. But the Crusades themselves would attack different parts of um, Islam. And a lot of these Crusades, even though they're saying it's for um, religious purposes to help regain the Holy Land and for Christendom, uh, there's a lot of economic motivators there too because of all the trade and resources that are down there, a lot of Crusaders go down there so they can make a fortune. Um, in the Crusades themselves, there's a, a lot of um, economic and cultural transfers that have a huge influence on Europe. Um, and where once they've been exposed to a lot of these new ideas, um, it helps in turn spark uh, a cultural rebirth in the um, European continent, and that is the Renaissance period. And this cultural rebirth uh, is going to be reinduced to a lot of classical ideas from the Romans and particularly the Greeks and a lot of other ideas that uh, were developed by both the Dura Islam as well as ideas that come far as far as from um, East Asia paper, uh, for example, um, you know, comes from, from East Asia, which was then taught to the um, Islamic world. And then, in, you know, in tune, it gets to the knowledge eventually ends up in Europe itself, right? So this is something of importance because that cultural rebirth and, and technological boom that occurs is going to propel more exploration by Europeans as they try to find more trade routes and more ways to get back east, which really what ends up happening is they run into the Americas uh, to their fortune. And that's something we'll talk more in great depth about when we get into unit four. Okay. So that is essentially the global tapestry in a nutshell. I know there are some things on this map that I did not talk about, but to save time, uh, I didn't want to overwhelm you with all this information um, and just stick to what is being presented on the, uh, the college board's curriculum so that you have the knowledge to be able to succeed there. Once again, your essential question, identify and explain the events, beliefs, and practices in Europe and what effect do they have on the period of 1200 to 1450? Yes, I saw the error and uh, the typo, so don't need to email me that. Anyway, other than that, uh, make sure that your responses are clear and concise and have good examples, and I will see you next time. Hope you're all healthy and safe.